Hi everyone, I think we'll get started and uh, I am very excited to be chairing this conversation, this panel, because I think we're really hearing all these different great stories about what each group is doing in uh, its own area and what great initiatives are happening with uh, education in different areas and how networks are collaborating to reach out in their community. But one thing that's still happening is that repair, while it's something so crucially important to us in at FixFest today, it's still very marginal in uh, you know our communities as a whole. And how do we move to a place where repair is indeed the norm, where there's no electronic waste, or certainly a lot less than there is today, where everyone has options available to do what we think is the right thing, which is to reduce the amount of stuff that we have to manufacture and move to extending the life of things well beyond what currently happens. And we have a wonderful set of panelists that will provide us with a lot of food for thought from different angles, from community repair perspective, as well as from research done in some parts of the UK, uh, to the experiences of people that repair also in part for a living. So it's all designed to help us start thinking a bit outside the normal box. And we'll have a part two uh, in the workshop format where we'll be able to explore more some of these topics uh, going forward. And uh, without losing any more time, I give the floor to Jane Dixon from Share and Repair Network. So I'm presenting the results of a survey that we did earlier this year, which is essentially, um, it's an attitudinal survey. Uh, and it was understanding the feelings and thoughts of consumers, consumers who are not necessarily involved in share repair projects. This is a general population survey. Um, and it was undertaken uh, by a research agency on our behalf. And so they surveyed a thousand people across Scotland, um, a fairly good geographic and demographic mix. So it was the urban areas of the central belt as well as um, more remote uh, rural areas of the highlands and islands. So just onto the results first and foremost, probably the most, yeah, the headline figure of the first uh, question is if an item of yours were broken, would you look into repairing it? And only 20% of people said no or they would be unlikely, which means that 80% of people were actually interested in potentially repairing something. Um, but if we look at how many people had actually heard of community projects where they could get things repaired, when prompted, only 30% uh, of people were aware. So people want to repair, but they're not necessarily aware that there are projects there out, out there that can help them. So I'm aware this is quite a dense slide with lots of information. Um, but the headline for the first one is that where do, if some people want to repair, where do they go for uh, that information and that advice? Overwhelmingly, initially, it's either the internet or it's friends and family. So if you look uh, towards the end of that slide, there's only 8% of people would actually go to a community <coughs> repair project, which ties in with the lack of awareness of the projects existing. Then if we look at which items would they consider repairing rather than buying new, top of the list, is small electronics um, and clothing and fabrics, which I think if you are involved in a community repair, repair, repair cafe, those are the sort of things most commonly coming through the door. Um, but sadly, the bottom row of figures will show that the things that are most commonly thrown away are small electrical items and clothing, uh, which probably reflects on the, the life cycle that people expect of those sorts of objects. 
Uh, okay, so this is this is a really another really striking figure. So the people who were asked, um, they thought that repairing and repairing projects was for everyone. They weren't looking at it. If you look at the smaller figures, they weren't saying it's for hipsters or it's for students or it's for environmentalists. <coughs> it's actually something uh, that should be available to everyone to be involved in. <coughs> And what would prompt you to visit a repair cafe? The first two are the really, really practical standout figures, and this comes out throughout the report. It's to save money. Saving money is really crucial, and just obviously getting something fixed. So people do care about the environment, and they do care about waste, but the money aspect is the most uh, significant um, for them. And what would put people off visiting? Really, again, really, really practical stuff. So the location is too far away and if the opening times aren't, aren't suitable. So this, again, is probably down to the number of projects available. If they have a project available on their doorstep, they're not likely to use it. Um, yeah, because it just, it's, it's, it's convenience. It's a modern consumer approach, I guess. Okay. What information would make you interested in visiting these projects? Again, this is looking at really, really practical simple things that people want to know. It's information, what can I get repaired at the repair cafe? What time is it on? Where is it on? Um, and yeah, how much would it cost me? And this, this is an interesting one of like, what, what do you feel, how do you feel you would benefit from using a repair project? So just to say, this survey did cover sharing projects as well, so I've just pulled out some of the elements that are relevant to repair, but there are some sharing elements in there as well. Again, the benefit, the main benefit that people are looking at is, is saving money over and above anything else. Um, and what would make you more likely to visit a share or repair project? Again, it's coming back to practicality and money, so if it were local, they would be more uh, interested in taking part and, and visiting a project. Um, I'm going to skip over that because that's relevant sharing projects. Okay, and then this, again, just sort of repeating essentially what I'm saying, what are the things that are most important to you? Uh, so the people who responded first off was cost saving, followed by reducing uh, environmental impact. And so the things that come further down to so the community, the social interaction, the things that we actually, when you're involved in a project, you know that are lovely about a project, maybe from the outside initially, if people aren't taking part, that's not something that would initially be um, of interest to them. Um, and again, I mean, if you, if you want to have a look at that one, but it's uh, cost of living is, is the most uh, agreed with statement about why people would take part in projects. So that's pretty much me. So in summary, uh, in terms of awareness, there is overwhelmingly people do want to, to repair things, um, but they're not aware of projects necessarily. Um, cost is a really huge motivating factor. <coughs> Info lust, which is people really, really want to understand. In order to engage with the project, they need to understand what it does, and it's really basic things. When is it on? Where is it? Can I get to it? What can I get repaired? Um, the social limits, so people do think that repairing projects are for everyone, but there is possibly one of the things that could, you could interpret the data as saying that there's a lack of interest in the loveliness that we know that happens at repair projects. So that's maybe something once people are through the door, they will appreciate how amazing it is to be involved, but it's actually a transactional uh, interaction that will get them through the door first place, they just want to get their stuff mended. Um, and getting people across the line, it really is just like, what do we do? How, how do we go about doing that? Um, there is currently, even, even when we look at the figures, there is a higher awareness of these projects than there are people who have actually taken place. Okay, and then my final slide is, from the report that we did, there were a few ideas about what could be taken forward, but I think that's probably more of a question for the, the room now, really, um, rather than me specifically going through that. Uh, and then finally, that's um, I work for Circular Community Scotland, for the Share Repair Network in Scotland. And if you want to get a copy of the report, you can download it, and it's available. Thank you. Yeah. Afternoon, everyone.
Thank you very much. Roger the press, just the uh, left and right button. Yeah. Right, okay. I've just still digesting my chickpea masala, so you have to do it. It's, it's kind of the, the lunchtime slot, isn't it? Um, I've just prepared a few slides, not too many. Um, and it, it's not as compre comprehensive as Jane's. It's as far less data, it's far more of a conversation. Um, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, well, look, let's move on. Who, who's Matt? Um, I'm not really sure how I got here. Not literally, I did my drone, but um, that was a few hours ago. Now. Um, I, my, my journey to, to this place here today um, is a bit strange because I, I, by day I work for a local authority, uh, although I try and keep that quiet most of the time. Um, been a lot of um, council talk today, so I'll try and keep that on the lowdown. Um, speak a bit closer. Can you hear me now? Is it better? No. Excellent. The hand up in the back. Louder. Louder. Is that better? There we go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, how did I get in? That's better, isn't it? It's much more volume. Um, I, I don't work for the local authority, and uh, I've tried to get that quite quiet, hence I'm standing over there before. Um, but I also run a side hustle business, um, Fix It Workshop, where it kind of started off as a little blog um, with all the kind of things that uh, Restart talk about, repair cafes talk about, and that was. 2017, kind of that same sort of time a lot of these things start to gather real momentum. And I found real pleasure in sharing my repair stories with members of the public. And on the back of that, it's generated repair commissions. And interestingly, looking at Jane's data, um, you know, 60% female uh, would get things repaired. Mine's probably a bit higher than that. Most of the uh, people in my inbox are, are ladies that want stuff repaired. Blokes seemingly less engaged with repair. Uh, that's the thing. Um, but yeah, through the website and through just generally being interested in repair, I've, I've been involved in a, a little telly thing recently, Retro Electro Workshop, if you've heard of it, on UK TV, I'm going to give them a little plug. And I've been working alongside um, a dumb chap called Rob Howard and Shamil Juman, and we've had a fantastic opportunity to talk about repair and show some repair of old radios and vintage retro tech on, on the TV channel. It's just finished now, but it's still available. Um, on UK TV plug. Also, duty bound to give them a plug. It's a really nice little coffee table watch if, uh, if you're into that sort of stuff. So it sits alongside the repair shop. I also write about repair as well and sustainability in a local magazine. Um, and I've got a general tech background as well. So for 20 odd years I worked for BT. I was an engineer, sort of trained technician, that kind of stuff. Went to college and tried to find out how you do it better, that kind of good, good practice. And I've also done some, um, some interviews on, on Radio Sussex, uh, if you're down that way, talking about repair as well. So I guess I'm sort of fully immersed in repair, um, but it's not my main day job, it doesn't pay my mortgage, uh, which we'll talk about, I guess, a bit later. So I guess, for me, one of my observations around repair is that you know, it's, it's still not the, the default option, you know, as, we, as we all know, I don't need to, to, to tell you all that really. But in a couple of generations, you know, from my, my grandparents, to my parents to now, you know, repair is not a default activity. And with planned obsolescence, um, you know, most, most the imported goods into the country with no support, you can, you can see why that's come about. Um, there's been a general removal of ownership from the things we have. And I think, just sort of stepping away from the slides, uh, I think you know, when I work with younger people now, they almost need to ask permission to, to take something apart, you know, if that's possible. They, they need permission to, to fix it. Am I allowed to do so? Well, of course you are. But they, they almost need that, that reassurance. And, and obviously there's the comparative cost of skills. You know, I was just about to, we're having a debate at home. Uh, do I really need the Amazon Prime membership, you know, the 80 odd quid? You know, and if something goes wrong, it's just tempting on you know, Saturday night to click buy now. And then even on a Sunday, I can have a replacement item at home, you know, the very next day, less, less than 12 hours time. Um, you know, Comparative cost of doing that versus, you know, wait for a repair cafe, wait for an expert, which could take months. Spares availability, uh, access to spare parts. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, alongside my main day job taking on really interesting repairs. And, and you can't get parts for stuff, so you have to get things made or find a specialist. Um, and that's if the manufacturer will talk to you. And there's some really good examples of that and, and some really poor examples. Um, and hang on, how do we overcome those things? And at the end of the day, it's a fashion society. Not my shirt, by the way, in three months, but uh, you know, we, we've, we've been, you know, our society has changed really from my, my grandparents' generation where they bought a Hoover and expected it to last for life. 
to people changing that mood because it doesn't suit their new house decor. You know? That's an extreme example, but uh, um, some of the things I talk about, you know, uh, in, in writing on the blog and, um, in, and in, in print as well. And I guess the, the, the part of the program um, was we, we, we majored on uh, the one on TV. The, we majored on sort of retro stuff because you could, it was just that, that vintage where you could repair something. Some of the older things that especially my colleague Rob was involved with, people making those, you know, the defiant radio, never ever saw built in obsolescence. There's a thing of beauty inside. You buy a Wi-Fi connected radio now, but you wouldn't expect it to last more than a pair of jeans. Things have changed. But things are looking up. Um, again, with my local authority hat on, um, most, most local authorities have got a climate emergency board or, or some kind of entity within their establishment um, that, that, that talks about climate change and you know, climate type related activity to, to try and ease the, the burden on the environment. And that boosts obviously knowledge and awareness of things like repair cafes. They're two are a natural fit, aren't they? So when we talk about repair cafes, we talk about climate emergency. It's all kind of good environmental practice. But, you know, curbside, uh, or rather um, waste electronics are still a problem. The council I work at, we've recently introduced curbside um, toaster collection, basically, as I like to call it. So nothing bigger than a toaster, that kind of thing, maybe a, maybe a hoover, will collect at the curbside and take it away. So it doesn't end up in the general waste stream. But, you know, listening to um, the, the lady from Suez, you know, our, our waste dump is nowhere near that advanced. And, you know, if you try to recover some of that stuff the other end, to then repurpose it, repair it, and redistribute it, we're nowhere near that. So there's, there's, there's regional dis you know, variation, which is a problem. But, you know, uh, it's becoming more mainstream. You know, you know everyone's seen probably the, the start of the repair shop. Love or loathe it. It, it, it really does bring repair to, to the forefront of our minds and it majors very much on, on emotional connections with, with items but it, it gets the message out there, it's a national conversation and um, maybe I'm a little bit envious I'm not on it but there we are. But yeah, we, you know, things like uh, James May the Reassembler, Made in Britain uh, and Inside the Factory I think have also kind of, sort of followed on from Antiques Roadshow, that, that bond with things, the things we love, the things we take for granted. So things are looking up, but uh, you know, repair cafe is giving up their time for free. Um, one minute, I'm going to wind it up. Free, free rules. I'm going to, I'm going to wind up with a skip through. So free resources, YouTube, that kind of stuff. Repair is easier than ever. But there's some annoying truths. Modern design can be uh, massive efficiencies. You know, a fridge made 50 years ago is nowhere near as efficient as one made today. Some of the products are downright dangerous. Some of the things that myself and Rob are working on would never be made now. Uh, and some older products are just not fit for the future. I'm just going to skip to my last slide. I believe that really to take everything we're talking about today into the next level, we need to be embedded in the, in the commercial world. I'm going to go slightly over time probably. We need to be with the manufacturers at the heart of design and celebrate the design that's right now. Um, there are pockets of good, good, good design out there. If you work on a pneumatic Hoover or work on a Brompton bicycle, you know they really do fully support their products end to end, and that should be celebrated. Oh, by the way, I don't work for these people. I'm just saying it because I see it in my inbox. Department of Education and central government policy need to be uh, endorsing this right across routes in schools. My two daughters are five and seven, and they do forest school, which is fantastic. We live by the sea, uh, so we're kind of connected to the downs and the seaside. But they talk about the animals and they talk about you know ecology. But no one's talking about repair. Surely the two are linked. But they are in my mind. Um, and again, joint ventures with commercial sectors on the high street. You know, as a council, we own a lot of property. And I know the other gentleman for, from Cornwall has, has moved things on a little bit, and I'm quite conscious to, that I need to speak to him. And again, it's that clear and consistent messaging around the UK. I'm wrapping up a bit, promise. <laughs> Um, where actually the, the, there isn't this disparity from Cornwall to, to, to Bath to, to Adrian Wood and where I am. I better leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is my presentation, but do you want me to do it now? Yeah, I'm just speaking, I'm not present. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Should I go then? Uh, sorry, I can't switch it off. If you don't mind leaving it there. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I'm Bettina Gilbert. Um, we, have, we were 
given a very strict five minute time limit. So I have not, I chose not to do slides. But basically, I'm the head of technical support and financial mechanisms for RAP. So you're probably going, who is that? What are you talking about? Um, so my job basically is I work with a lot of, well, I lead the teams across all of RAP, and I'll get to that in a minute. But um, predominantly work with people like local authorities to help them design and implement their recycling systems, their waste recovery systems, um, and also looking at reuse on things like HWRC sites. I also have a team that looks at public procurement, so driving demand for reused um, products, but also building repair and contracts and things like that. And um, the financial mechanism side is that I need a team that actually looks at, so leading all of our delivery, all of our grants and um, loan schemes, guarantee schemes. So I'll pick up on that topic in a moment. So if you haven't heard of RAP, basically what we are, we are a global NGO, climate change NGO. We have a very ambitious vision statement for a vision where, um, a vision for a thriving world where climate change is no longer a problem. And I know that sounds very, very grand, but we are working in 44 countries around the globe and getting larger all the time. Um, basically, that is an evidence-based organization, so we have a lot of evidence gathering. We're known for working collaboratively, so we get the right people in the room. We don't always deliver the interventions ourselves. We'll work with the networks that are already there, like yourselves. Um, and then we basically go out and we try to drive change using that evidence and, and working with the right people. And um, you may notice, really, for our work around um, plastics, food, we're kind of the global leader on food waste prevention, or textiles. Um, and my team looks at resource management, so what happens to all those materials when nobody ever, you know, when people don't want them anymore. Um, and you also may be familiar with some of our brands, like Love Food Hate Waste, or in Wales, the Be Mindy Recycling Campaign. If you buy some packaging and you see a swoosh on there, a green swoosh with a heart on it, that's wrap. And also, um, Recycle Now. So if you live in England, you can leave your branding around recycling, all that messaging, all the, all the signage you see, that's all wrap. So that gives you an idea of who we are. In Wales, I lead a team that is working with the Welsh Government to help them deliver their very ambitious targets for zero waste. So in Wales, our recycling rate is about 64%, we're third best in the nation. And the Welsh Government is now looking at, well, actually, let's look further up the waste hierarchy where waste is no longer a problem, so we can have zero waste to landfill. So we're providing them with quite a lot of policy support. So we do that through developing things like guidance and case studies, but we've also done um, two recent pieces of research in Wales, which haven't been published yet, but have very similar findings from yours. So that first piece of research is looking at the skills needed in Wales to increase reuse and repair, what's needed from a skills basis to normalize that activity and really grow that economy. And the other bit is around consumer behavior. So we've also looked at the um, people's attitudes and behaviors towards both reuse and repair. Really similar findings on those. So we found that 70% on average are receptive to repair, but only about 36% of people who had an item that needed a repair were, were getting that item repaired. And in terms of the repair cafes in Wales, where there's actually a policy driver and a target in the program for government for 80 repair cafes around the nation, we found that um, about a third were familiar with repair cafes, but 44% said that they would, they would engage them. Now, I think that's probably a bit conservative. If they don't know what it is, you know, they don't know the benefits, we could probably bring that number up. But I think that really highlights the, the question today is how we normalize these behaviors. Yeah. And right before I finish, I'm going to throw a little bit of a challenge out there, maybe something for discussion. But the other thing I really wanted to do today, because we are an evidence-based organization and we are a global organization, is just give you guys some kind of, you probably already know this, but I just wanted to celebrate the importance of your work a little bit. So right now the global economy, according to the Circle Economy, which is a Dutch organization, um, they do something called the uh, Circular Gap Report annually. It's a global report. This year they say that um, the 
global economy is only 7.2% circular, so they have a way of measuring this, right? This is declining every year. Now, for us to live within our planetary boundaries, which are the boundaries that make it habitable for human life on this planet, we have to reduce our consumption of materials and extraction by a third. And the way that happens is through the circular economy, is through what you guys are doing, is by keeping items in use for longer, by repairing them, by not using so many materials. And so following on to that, it's not for app research, so of course I'm going to talk about app research just to close off. Um, we've done some uh, data gathering, two sets actually. First we did it in the UK, then we did it bigger for the G7. So in G7, if we make better use of our products by extending the product lifetimes, we would save 525 million tons of carbon emissions each year, right? And that's, yeah, so that's just in the G7. So if everybody was repairing, if we were able to normalize repair, right, the benefits of that are massive. So I was going to just kind of finish up on there, and the last thing I wanted to say is, because I lead a team that's in charge of funding mechanisms. I'm really curious to explore all of the incentives that are available to us to normalize repair. I know in France recently, as part of, I think it's the, probably part of their um, textiles extended producer responsibility program, they've launched a voucher, a repair voucher for clothing, to incentivize consumers, so it helps subsidize the cost of repair, um, you know, to incentivize consumers to repair the clothing. So I would say, let's all talk about all the tools that are available to us to normalize repair, including investment in those kinds of incentives. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, just to add that in France, the same measure exists also for electric or electronic. So, ah, there we and go. And not just in France, also in Austria. Yeah, yeah. Germany. So it's, it's possible. <laughs> That's right. Yes, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Chris McCartney. I was involved in setting up Prepare Cafe Belfast five and a half years ago. And we have since helped nine other communities to start Repair Cafes in Northern Ireland. I have no research. I'm going to speak very anecdotally about my experience and what I've witnessed. And I'm sure you've all seen a lot of things happen in your repair cafe and have a lot of um, interactions with people who come. Um, I'd like to start by flipping a topic and, and uh, maybe taking a step back and saying, actually, it is repair that is normal. And the way that we have been throwing stuff out for the last um, decade or a few decades, that's what's not normal. Um, and I, think, I think actually what community repair is doing is, uh, is unearthing that reality that's just below the surface in our communities and for the people that come. Um, we're helping people to kind of rediscover that and helping our communities to rediscover that. Oh, um, this is a, some feedback from what our visitors have said and I think it's really interesting what Jane was saying about all the different reasons that people have for coming to a repair cafe. And one of the things that's beautiful is you don't really need to know about the waste crisis and the environmental crisis to come to a repair cafe. You can have a lot of different motivations and it can be as simple as my toaster doesn't work to come through that door. Um, and people have a lot of different reasons but whatever the reason, we, we see often visible relief their shoulders drop, they find something they can do about their broken item. For some people that's um, relief uh, at a discomfort the way we're living and the feeling that it's not, it doesn't feel good, it's not sustainable, it's it, a cause of anxiety. Um, and also this sense that it's not about me as an individual having to fix this toaster or fix the system, actually we can come together in a community space and do it together. Um, Half of people who come to our repair cafe in Belfast are there for the first time each time. We move around different venues across our city so that we meet a lot of different people. And I think that has really helped us to get out and meet, meet more people. Um, and repair cafes just often really make sense to people. And I think we maybe all see that when they come. It's like, I wish I'd discovered you sooner. This is so sensible and so enjoyable and so uh, helping me in so many ways um, to get my stuff fixed. Um, gotta go 
back in. This is actually a different PowerPoint I meant to show, but anyway, we're just going to look at lovely pictures of Repair Cafe Belfast. I think there's also a sense of relief and joy among our fixers and volunteers um, to be able to do something, to be able to contribute, to be able to help people, um, to see their skills being appreciated and made visible. And um, one of the the things that people ask when it was a concern for me when I was first getting started because I'm not a great fixer myself um, and what inevitably when we talk to another community about starting a repair cafe they say but where do you find the skills and sometimes people walk into a repair cafe room with all this stuff going on and they say isn't it a shame we don't have these skills anymore and it's almost like would you like to look around the room because the skills are there they are in our communities, but they have been privatised into garden sheds and at kitchen tables. And they are not, even when we bring them out into the open in a repair cafe and give them a place where they can be celebrated and appreciated and made visible, um, they're not necessarily uh, seen in a way that is counted by the economy. And so they are not necessarily uh, um, recorded or appreciated in the way that we appreciate them because we see them and we know they're at the heart of what we do. Um, when I look around a, a repair cafe room, I see a huge cross-section of people from different walks of life, different ages, mentioned about different motivations for being there. And I think we put a lot of emphasis on making our events really getting the atmosphere right and making them really fun, both for our volunteers, because then they keep coming back and try not to miss one and really enjoy it, but also for the people coming to get something fixed. Um, and so it becomes more than just about convenience and getting something repaired. The impact that we can have is, is about fixing the item, but it can also be a deeper experience because people have come and had a really enjoyable morning and they've not wanted to leave and they've had a personal connection with the person who's fixing their thing. So it's not only that they got it fixed, but they, they kind of learned from that person, and they saw that person, and they saw their skills. And because it's, it, it's happening in that context, it can be much more transformational than just, I got my phone fixed at the phone shop, and that's great because I didn't have to buy a new one. It can actually, and we hear this, and one of the quotes on the thing, if it's gonna come up, was about a woman who came and she got one chair fixed and she was part of it and she was shown what to do and she said, I'm going home now to fix the other five myself. And we see all the time people who come and they see what other repairs are taking place and what else is possible to fix. And they are, we hope, going home and thinking anew about their stuff and about their relationship with their stuff. Because our stuff matters and the way we treat our stuff relates to the way we treat each other and the way we treat our planet. Um, and I think repair cafes can give a glimpse of a different reality about that. So there's so much interest and appetite, um, but many of our repair cafe groups are entirely voluntary, many are small groups, and we've talked today also about the potential to do other things and for it to become a business, and that is right for some projects to go in that direction, but I think there is also still a really valuable place for that community-led response, because we are in there, in the community, and um, involving a lot of people. We've gone from one to 10 repair cafes in Northern Ireland in five years, with a small, small amount of funding, a few days of paid work over those five years. Imagine what we could do with just a little bit more practical support and resource, and without a pandemic in the meantime. It, it goes a long way towards normalizing repair and having repair in every, in every town and community. So for those who are thinking about the public sector or you know, what, what could be done, um, my first question is ask what your local group needs rather than assume that you know. Because we've been offered you know, loads of publicity and we've been asked to come to events and take part in things. It's not always where we're coming from and what we want to do and what, what's going to actually help us. Um, and Peter talked this morning about the small, small amount of uh, leeway that councils have with their budgets. They are still dealing with massive amounts of um, premises, of support, of land, of um, staff capacity, which um, is huge compared to what uh, small volunteer groups have. So there may be things that you can help with you don't even realise. Sometimes it is about funding, but sometimes it's just about a bit of capacity and a bit of backup. The idea of insurance feels like it's a massive... Uh, it's a massive issue to get over, and if um, insurance was resolved, I think that would um, help us all, practically speaking. 
Um, yeah, so I'm glancing at my notes. I think that's all I want to say. Um, that I think there's still a really important place for the community aspect of what we do and for repair to continue at a community level as well as becoming more of the economy and more repair things moving into business. Thank you. Great to, to get all these different angles. I guess uh, before uh, moving into workshop mode, uh, I wanted to ask a question uh, and then ask if there's a couple of questions from, from the room. Is, um, my, my question, and perhaps uh, it can go to uh, both Jane and Chris, is uh, we're, we've seen uh, a multiplication and expansion of uh, the number of groups that do community repair. And obviously here we are representing the, the repair community through community repair groups. But it's hard to imagine a world where uh, there's enough community repair uh, to really take care of all the repair that needs happening. So how do you see uh, the best role that uh, our initiatives can have in helping create the conditions for repair to thrive more uh, 360 degrees in our own communities? And, and all of you are happy to, I mean, are welcome to answer, but I'm particularly interested from your angle as, to begin with. Uh, if you have any thought. Or if others want to answer that, that's good too. <laughs> um, I, like I often describe a repair cafe as a first aid clinic for your staff, and it's, it's like primary care, isn't it? And so, actually there is universal coverage of GPs and primary care, healthcare in, in our communities, but often things need to go to the hospital, they need a more specialist tool or more time or whatever and I think repair cafes can be a gateway for people um, and what like we've been struggling to know how to um, capture the repair businesses that are in our community we don't have the capacity to research that we cannot get the council interested in producing some kind of guide or anything um, but we would like to know where to signpost people on to um, and I think I mean I, I can see a world where there's a repair cafe available to everybody in Northern Ireland and I'm excited about that world but it's never going to fix everything because it's not about that it's about uh, reaching out changing the attitudes changing people's relationship and they're, they're removing that level of intimidation about getting something repaired because it's a very friendly welcoming space but then we need places to point people onto when we can't do all the fixing. Mm -hmm. Yeah I'd agree in terms of <clears throat> um, the, the the big contribution obviously repair cafes. Sorry, like can we have a mic at oh, down sorry. the What the, we don't know where it is. So uh, can you okay, come yeah, back yeah, here? It was yeah. I'm just gonna make a small point and just what repair cafes contribute is is a huge amount, but what they can contribute massively is attitudinal change. And I think it's within it's within jigsaw of lots of other things happening. It's not that repair cafes, cafes or repair projects can be the ultimate answer to everything, but they're a part of the solution. And as well as fixing stuff, and I think your analogy of being the GP of the repair world is a really good idea. Um, but yeah, attitude change, I think, and there's, there's evidence that anecdotal evidence and real evidence that people do get a sense of what can be changed um, and what can be repaired once they start there. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, more conversation more conversation of this will happen in the workshop part, but if there's two short questions from the floor, yeah, start over there and then you. And then we'll just move to the other side and I'll explain how it's gonna work. Yeah? So I have a short question, but I don't think the answer will be short. But basically <laughs> in terms of normalizing repair, um, how how do we expect to normalize repair when manufacturers and large corporations are 
invested in selling us more things and have conditioned us to actually want the next shiny object. Yeah, that, that is an excellent question on, <laughs> that relates to some of the interest in, on the panel on policies, I think. Uh, and we shouldn't just focus on what we can do in the community, for sure. Uh, but I think it's a good food for thought for the second part. Uh, what was your point? Yes, Matt, um, I, I'm a huge fan of retro electro. Yes! Uh, <laughs> and I'm a huge fan because unlike Repair Cafe, people don't weep copiously yeah. all over the repairs, which is something that has, has happened with the other programs which I don't like particularly. Can I just say two things? First of all, um, the introduction um, suggests that there are very few people around that do these kind of repairs. Please look at the repair cafe movement across the country. We're all there, all us old folks that fix stuff. We're all still there. So, so please up. get to stop saying that. And second point, this is the question. Will there be a second series, please? <laughs> <laughs> we're all waiting for baby breath. Can't hear you. Hello. It doesn't work, does it? Shall nice. yeah, we we'll all wait for baby breath on me? Second series, right. um, but um, yeah, the, we, I think Rob and I especially cringed when we when we sort of hear last repairs because yeah. it, 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 it just it's like uh, like that. Um, and, and again, you know, when you sort of look at a room full like this, and this is just the sort of tip of the iceberg. And I don't know who said it. Someone said, you know, basically repair is has is, is gone into the shadows. You know, he, he's, when my dad used to um, work for an Indeset. Um, High street repairs like Rumbelows. Do you remember them? Yeah. And, and he would repair washing machines and dishwashers. But it, that sort of shrunk into the shadows, you know. And if you're in London, you know, the sort of spin doctor who's made a career for himself, you know, mending machines. But this was more ubiquitous years ago. But the, the skills are there. They just need. They've shrunk into the kitchen. And uh, we don't have more time. Sorry. We have to go in the other room. Sorry to working groups and the. We'll go to the other room in. Uh, next to all the stalls, I'll walk with all of you and we'll split in groups. Uh, each of the panelists will be on a table and I'll be on a table as well. I guess we'll be trying to follow on the key points that they made and if there's some points that you want to make that are not covered or unrelated to theirs, come and join my table and uh, we'll have exactly 30 minutes in groups and then uh, we'll still be there and report back on the key ideas that have come up. Thank you.